Um, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for coming tonight. My name is Natalie Fritz and I am the archivist and director of, director of collections outreach and social media for the Clark County Historical Society. And uh, we've been doing these virtual programs since May of 2020 on various topics in um, Springfield's history. And I can't believe that we didn't think to do one about Wrens earlier. Uh, but the reason that this one came about is because uh, our uh, registrar, uh, Rachel White, had uh, gotten us started with a partnership program with um, the library, which is next door to us. And uh, we have, uh, starting in June, we've been doing these history in your own backyard uh, kind of mini exhibits where we get to put a poster up over at the library. Uh, and we get to, we put a poster up in our um, our lobby that kind of tells people a little bit about something about local history, uh, and it encourages people from here to go over and check out stuff resources at the library, and it encourages people at the library to come over here, which is something surprised we didn't think of sooner because they're just right across the tracks from us. So uh, we're uh, the last month we did something about Juneteenth uh, and the Gammon House, and we had the trust truck out. Uh, at the Gammon House during uh, Juneteenth that people got to see, um, which was a local plumber. Uh, and this month we are focusing on Christmas in July um, and using Wrens as to kind of tell that story and showcase some things from the collection. Uh, so tonight we're, uh, we decided to do a virtual program to go along with um, the exhibit. We're gonna expand the exhibit next month and have more out in our lobby as well. Um, but uh, tonight's program, we're gonna hopefully hear from you guys. Uh, I always tell people when I do these programs that I am not a time traveler. I am not old enough to remember any of this stuff and I'm not from here. Uh, so everything that I've learned about Springfield history, I've learned since working here at the uh, Clark County Historical Society. Um, and I, I learn from people in the community, groups online, all of our wonderful volunteers. If I don't know about something, I know I can ask them and they'll know about it. Uh, so uh, programs like these are great to have people um, jump in, share their own stories, make corrections if we have things wrong about <laughs> pictures or people or places. Um, so um, that's what we're hoping to do tonight, to hear from you guys about your own experiences downtown and shopping at Wren's and all of that. So um, as with all of our virtual programs, we record them so people can watch them later and we can record some of the great stories and things that people share. Um, this will be on our Facebook page and on our YouTube later. Um, Right now, I have it so that um, you can mute and unmute yourself. Um, we may mute people if there's background noise that's being picked up and you're not talking. Um, so you can just unmute yourself if you want to um, talk. And you can use the chat function on Zoom if you uh, want to say something but don't necessarily want to say it out loud or you want to ask a question. Um, you can put it in the chat and we'll be paying attention to that as well. So uh, I wanted to start with a, uh, a picture of Edward Wren because uh, everyone that we're talk talking primarily about Wrens and the story of Wrens goes back pretty far um, in the community. Uh, Edward Wren himself was born in 1849 in uh, uh, Cary County, Ireland, and he married uh, Maggie Kinane, Margaret Kinane, in 1871, and they came to um, the United States, uh, first to uh, Lancaster, Ohio in 1873, and then um, they settled in Springfield in 1877 because Maggie had family here. Her brothers had opened uh, the Canaan Brothers uh, store, which was a um, dry goods store in 1870 here in Springfield. Um, this next picture here is just uh, a great picture, a couple of great pictures of the um, of Edward Wren's mansion that still stands. Um, you can see it, it today. This is just a screenshot from Google Maps. It's over by the Speedway at uh, Limestone and McCrite. Um, and I can't remember, I don't know if anyone remembers when they when the sign went up calling it Wren Hill, but I don't think that was, um, I don't know if it was always referred to as that, but I know that that sign, uh, particular sign wasn't always there. Um, well, but this picture here is from um, April, 1972. And then this is an earlier picture from uh, a Springfield publication uh, here on the left. So it's a beautiful building still standing, it's being used is offices for um, a couple of different organizations now. So um, I have some pictures here uh, from the archives of 
uh, Canadian Ren and Co. So when they he joined together with his uh, brothers-in-law, Edward, Daniel, John, and I think James, um, Edward joined with them. Uh, and they had a store first at the corner of Spring and High was where um, the original uh, uh, Canaan Brothers store was. Uh, and then they later had a location. It was um, on Limestone between Main and High Street um, in the, the Rabbits building. Uh, so this was so shows some pictures of employees out front um, various years. Uh, and they had a um, it was dry goods, carpet, wallpaper, boots, shoes, all sorts of, of different things. Um, they had up to 90 clerks at their highest, um, 75 of them who were salesmen. Um, but the partnership between the brothers, uh, or between uh, the Canaan's and uh, Mr. Wren um, ended in, um, I've seen a couple of different dates, but uh, we know at least by 1894 when the Bushnell building was opened that um, Canaan brothers had moved over there um, and Wren moved over to um, uh, Limestone. So this is a picture here showing uh, the Canaan brothers in the Bushnell building. On, on East Main Street. I don't know the year of this one exactly, um, but it's a great picture that shows the tracks and horse and buggies. And uh, a fun fact about um, Canadian Wrens is that uh, Springfield was one of the first cities in the United States to have an electric power plant, and the first electric uh, lights were installed in Cana the Canadian Wrens store downtown. So this was where um, one half of the company went. And then uh, this was just something interesting. Uh, if, uh, Flossie's on here today, uh, Flossie Holsizer, she was going through the newspapers, hand copying out uh, things from the newspaper. And I happened to walk by when she had this page open that had an ad for both Canaan Brothers and Wrens uh, from uh, 1900. So this was the Press Republic uh, newspaper, which is not on microfilm and it's not indexed or anything. So Fossey, uh, to make stuff different, information stuff accessible to researchers, she hand copies out information from these. So she happened to be on this page and I was like, hey, I'm doing a presentation about that tonight. Let me grab a picture. So these were the two ads that were on October uh, 1900 uh, for Ren's store had an important announcement um, about some um, special products that were coming in. And uh, Canaan Brothers had a blanket and bedding sale going on. So this is stuff, I mean, if we wanted to, uh, to trace the history of all their ads and everything through time, you could, you could spend forever going through the newspapers um, collecting that kind of stuff. I love this, though. Thousand Cats Wanted on the same page. Uh, this is a uh, picture showing their uh, letterhead when uh, they moved over to High Street. And this is from a really great collection that we have. It's a uh, early 1920s scrapbook of pictures, mostly from How um, Howard Weber Sr. That was Howdy Weber's father, if anybody uh, remembers him, who um, had uh, been a photographer for the um, Springfield newspaper. Um, but his father uh, was in partnership with um, a man named uh, Harrison, uh, and they took a lot of uh, outside exterior photos of, of a lot of different businesses. Mm -hmm. And all, all of the scrapbook pages included a, um, a picture of the outside of the building and whatever letterhead they had. So it's a really great resource um, to see who was in charge of different companies or what they were selling, where they were located. Um, it's a really neat resource for finding that kind of stuff for all sorts of businesses that were around at that time. Uh, so. When Wren split off on his own, um, Edward Wren moved over to uh, Limestone, and eventually he took up the entire um, corner around the block down to the Regent Theater. Um, they were spread out in all those buildings there from 111 to 117 uh, South Limestone. Um, just to give you an idea of where that is, um, 117 South Limestone is currently the um, uh, Regent Theater. So. Uh, this is one of the uh, original buildings. Um, this picture on the, is from around 1916, I believe. Uh, or sorry, one six, this is, uh, would have been about 115 South Limestone um, in the early 1900s. Uh, that should be. Not sure if these ones are a little bit later. If anybody knows the dates on these, I don't know cars. 
have a feeling like Bill McGregor on here with no car sweater to date these, but these came from different publications. Um, this is one from that scrapbook. So this would be around 1924 or so is what we think that that scrapbook came from. Um, so to show you kind of where we are today, um, later this building, this is a picture from 1947 on the left. It was called the Brain King Building. Um, and the address was 113 to 115 South Limestone. Um, and it sat next to what was then the Walgreens. Um, so it sat vac vacant for a few years. And this picture here from 1947 was talking about when it was sold to Link uh, by Lincoln Link um, to be redeveloped for a new re retail store. Um, but by this point, um, Renz was long gone because they had moved over to the Bushnell building, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, but the spot where this building stood is where this parking lot area is now uh, next to the Regent Theater space. Um, here's a few more pictures. These ones I just grabbed really quick. We have the originals of these in the archives, but I grabbed these from um, Harry Laburn's book, um, which I'm sure a lot of you have copies of. Um, but this is showing uh, Renz in 1915 uh, and occupied this building here and this building on the corner um, and the bank, uh, farm, it was Farmers National Bank at the time in the center there. This is about the time um, that they had, uh, were having a, a, they had a grocery department uh, and this was a, something that had come into our collection was this little brochure uh, for um, grocery price list of things that you could buy from the Edward Run Company when they were still located um, up there on um, Limestone. And then this is a bit later. Um, I believe we have a picture uh, closer up of the Regent Theater here. Um, from in front of the theater, but this one here shows that you can see people lined up all the way down the block for the Regent. And then on this side, they're lined up all the way down the block to go the other side to the Majestic, which was um, down the other side of Limestone. Um, so this, is, if this is, I think this may have been, I think that's Saratoga down there is what that says on that side. Um, so this may have been just before Renz uh, moved over to uh, East Main Street in the Bushnell building. This is another view um, from the late 30s. We knew that um, Renz was there and that at one point they started leasing to Sears, um, which this part of the, this building still stands. If you go by there now, that's just the one that's being renovated into uh, condos, um, but the building directly behind it is, is now gone. That's the, uh, the parking lot uh, behind the Marriott. And so I, I said that most of the stuff I learned, I learned from my volunteers and, and people in town. Um, Marguerite Brinkman is an uh, amazing, wonderful volunteer. I love her. Um, she um, had been working with us on Wednesdays for many, many years, but she hasn't been in for a while. So I was really excited when she agreed to come down uh, last month to talk to me because um, I learned a lot of what I knew about the downtown stores from, from her because her and Ruth Stiles would sit and help identify lots of pictures that we had. Um, so she sat down and she um, shared some stories and she had some, uh, let me make sure that I'm sharing my sound. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Make sure my sound is shared. So let me know if you can hear the sound still. Um, yes. This is her um, sharing a little bit about, uh, she didn't She what didn't go through the move, but her, uh, her boss told her what the move was like as they moved over to, uh, Main Street. Because I think it moved in 39, I think. Yes, what... and, and I remember Mr. Kite telling me stories about when they moved. Because I think it moved in 39, I think. Yes, what... and, and I remember Mr. Kite telling me stories about when they moved. Uh, this Renz then, it friends on the corner and, and it went clear down almost half a block on high street but when they moved out of the building they bricked up half of it that was separate from what the whole wind store was and mr kai used to talk about them moving so quickly that they were throwing merchandise walls as they were bricking them up between the two stores. 
So I know that um, that it came back, it came about pretty quickly that they didn't have time to do the planning that they should have. Yeah. Well, it became Sears over there after that, it didn't became, it? Yeah, yeah, that's why they formed a separate wall between what was the old Grand's and their store. Mm. So they they had uh, interesting stories to tell. And Pat. Uh, so that was actually the move when they were just when Sears was moving into that back uh, building there when they were bricking that up. And I'd heard that story from a few other people as well. Um, this is another uh, piece from our collection from around that time period. And this is something that I got to share earlier this year when we were sharing cookbooks from our collection. There was a cookbook from the Edward Wren Company, uh, Food for Our Friends. And I love that had the um, different reception menus that you might offer to for a party. Um, and uh, scalloped oysters, which uh, again, one of our volunteers, Ruth Stiles, gave me her, her recipe and I thought I would try it and just realized, no, that is, it's, I don't like oysters. <laughs> but that was a very popular thing and oysters were a very popular thing that you see uh, popping up all over newspapers and recipes and everything. Uh, but these are some um, from those, um, those early years. We've got the, the full cookbook, um, there's just a couple pages. Um, so we're getting, I'm getting to the, the part in the story where they, um, in the 30s, where they moved over to um, the Bushnell building. So this is an older picture showing still um, canines over there, um, the bottom of the building. Um, this is a great picture that shows some other businesses, um, Bancroft Furriers, which I know we've got some great furs and pieces from there. Um, John Stokes. Our, our maintenance guy was actually wearing a Bancroft uh, Furrier's hat the other day uh, that had that mark on it uh, that you see on the, uh, uh, the overhang there. Um, and CC Free Jewelers uh, is still, that building still stands there um, alongside. Um, this little building here in the middle is the one that's gone. Um, if you go where you can see the Rose, um, uh, the Rose Alley um, painting that's on the wall there now. Um, but that, that um, area has, a, has a, another long history um, as part of the section was the home store um, under there. Um, one of the employees that worked for Canaan and Wren, um, Edward Tehan, um, in 1908, he joined, he, um, joined with um, to create the Fahian, I'm not sure how, Tehan Company. Um, and they had a dry, good, dry business goodness in the Fairbanks building, and then they later moved into the Bushnell building. So this was a picture here showing um, their storefront, and this would have been before Wren's moved over there. So in 39, uh, Wren's had moved there. Um, this is an uh, undated picture from our collection, but again, cars will probably help you date it a little bit better. Um, but you can see some of the windows there. We've got, looks like, uh, uh, a wedding dress over here, and um, this is a great one. One of the only ones I've seen that shows um, the windows well uh, further back from the building, uh, as opposed to close-ups of, of certain windows. Uh, and that building was it was built and opened in 1894, um, and that's when Canaan's had originally moved over there. So most people would know this as the Wren's building. Uh, it's Another view here, later years. You can see this is, we've got 70 has come through at this point. So um, that would help us date that one closer. Uh, and this is a great picture. I, I It's cropped out a little bit, but this was, um, Marguerite had been holding this one because this, we had just, we had gotten this one donated. And that's when, I was, I think the first time I realized that she had worked at Rent. She was telling me about that she had worked in the window department. Uh, and this is a great picture that shows uh, this building is is um, gone now too. This is where the um, the patio for Stella Blue is um, now. But that had been a, a building that burned down. Um, I can't remember what the business was there last. If anyone remembers, um, within the last ten years, that little space on this side. But you can see the this was the rent the men's department entrance here. So you have the the big sign up there, and I think you can still see. The remnants of that uh, on the wall, um, a pie on the brick there. Um, some of the advertising they have the C 
citywide, all the downtown stores had dollar day. Um, so this was Ren's advertisement in the uh, uh, 1930s. And then a, a later one, this was a after Thanksgiving clearance sale. Um, so again, if you wanted to trace the history all the way through, um, I see we've got a hand over there. If you made it, John, did you have a question? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, that's fine. A <laughs> um, couple more clippings. Uh, if anyone remembers, there was a parking garage on, on one side of the street. Um, this was the one that opened in 1953. It was Ayleshire's parking garage when that would open. It was later um, just a city called the City Garage. Um, but this was the little uh, people movers that took the drivers up and down because people didn't weren't able to drive their own car and it was very steep. So they employed their own drivers to help to just uh, take the cars and, and park them and return them. Um, and then the uh, other uh, parking garage that was actually for the Bushnell building was built later. And that's the one that just came down this year. So if anybody watched that, that was quite a, a, long, a long process of taking down that that parking garage and now it's totally changed the landscape of, of North uh, uh, Fountain over there. Uh, this is a picture um, not long at when they were taking down the, um, the roundabout uh, part uh, at the beginning. This was on a Bill Lackey's uh, pictures from the newspaper. So that one direct co connected directly to the building. So um, once that one was built, I think uh, correct me if I'm wrong, people use that more frequently to, to access uh, RENs, um, but they had had the one across the street as well. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, does anyone remember the RENs twins or did anybody yes. know them? Yes. Um, Eileen and Bernadine uh, Hopkins, um, they uh, worked there, I think Bernadine started there first in 1957 and Eileen uh, later joined her there and they would always have, um, you know, their lunches, take their lunches and their breaks together. And uh, the article, Tom Stafford wrote a couple of great articles um, interviewing them and their family um, about that no one ever really could tell them apart. So at one point they split them up and had them on different floors so that they weren't so confused as to who was who. Um, I had a hard time finding a good picture of them, even online. Um, they only had a, a very tiny one of the two of them together. But I do remember that when the, art, uh, the earlier Tom Stafford article, it had some great pictures of them, but I couldn't, um, I, I hadn't found that one before today to go back and get pictures from that. But um, they said that their Wren's clothes would last forever. They were always very well-dressed and they, they got their clothes from there. Um, and they worked there for over 30 years. Marianne, did you knew them? Yes, I did. <laughs> yep. Not well, just I knew them because they worked there, you know. Seemed like very sweet ladies. Um, got a, a, a story from Marguerite about how she got her, her job there. Um, so we were talking about the... Oh, co-op. The, the co-op course. Yeah. yeah. So that was why I ended up working at Wren was that you had to get a job before school started in September. So I, I had to find work in some place that they gave you a list of places that you could work at. Um, there was something that came to mind. Yeah, well, I told you. Did you walk to work then from school? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But then, you know, Springfield High School then was only a few blocks from downtown. Where did you live? Um, where did you grow up? What? I, I lived every place. We, we were a family that moved often because not as many people owned their homes mm -hmm. then as they do now. And so we moved often. And uh, so I... Uh, didn't live in one neighborhood, and I went to a lot of schools. Yeah. So that's how I ended up working at Rens was that I could go to school half a day and work half a day because I wasn't that thrilled about school. <laughs> so what did what did you make um, throughout the years? Well, while I, you I'm the there? only 
specifically, I can tell you that after I left at eight years, I made 80 cents an hour. You don't recall what you started at? Did no. they? Did you get raises it throughout the? It was less than that. Less than it that. It was less than that. But we we had perks. We had during the war. You know there were no nylon hose, and no one could get nylon hose at all. So when any came available, uh, stores could not get their full allotment. They'd get a few. And at Wren's, they always offered them to the employees first. And so that was a big deal to buy nylon, except at that time, when I, I was 15, I didn't wear nylon. <laughs> if I was tuned into the black market, I never could have made a killing, but I wasn't smart enough at that time. And I had two sisters. <laughs> so that took care of it. But I love that Marguerite uh, um, she was very young when she started uh, 15, 16 so um, I just think that's that's funny that she was talking about she, so we she, talking she used about the black market uh, uh, this was another uh, service that uh, not a lot of people remember, but um, I know that I talked to somebody recently that had worked at the um, lending library in the 50s. Uh, so this is a, a brochure from the lending library in the uh, in the 20s um, over there. But um, somebody had donated a, a book from the Wren's lending library. It had its own little uh, little tags and its own cover on it. Um, so I think this means she she had taken the book, <laughs> but uh, but this was a somebody up there likes me. My life so far by Rocky Graziano. It's a 1955 publication that you could. Um, Marguerite talks about that it was five cents a day um, when you went through um, when you could get from the uh, uh, the lending library, um, and they they often got um, titles before the library had them. And I'm going to see before I get this one started, I'll see if I can um, turn up the volume a little more on this side to see if it helps. I have it up as, as high as I can get um, on a couple of other settings. Um, I want to back up to the library. Not a lot of people yes. know that Wren's had a lending library. Um, well, well, you know, and, they charged you. You paid uh, like five cents. If you took a book out, you paid five cents. But the good part about it was they always had the brand new books. When they first came out, you could go there and get them and pay five cents a day and have them before the public library would have them. And there was, the store was, the first floor set up so that there was a balcony in the back and the library was part of it. And the other part of it was a, a jewelry store it was George Wisden who had a store here in this building for a while after he left, after Wren's closed. But they sold nice gin, nice jewelry there. And in fact, my, my fiance bought my engagement ring there and they gave me my 15% discount. <laughs> well, that, that was very nice. Does anyone uh, remember the uh, the lending library there? It's still existing. We were trying to figure out uh, um, how wanna... long that lasted. Um, we've got um, another person I got to sit down with. I don't know if you guys know Linda Anderson. She had a very long history with um, with Wrens. She started um, uh, during high school and worked all the way up uh, until she was with Macy's um, in, when she retired in 2004. And she kind of got into it um, the same for, through a high school program. I'm, and, and then I've got some questions. Okay, I'm Linda Anderson, and I uh, started in Wrens in, let's see, 1969, and uh, went through the buying organization and started out like when I was on a team board, still in high school. We had, uh, there was one um, girl that was selected from every high school to represent their school and uh, work with Lois Bernstein, and uh, we did fashion shows, and uh, 
uh, events. We actually opened the first Taco Bell in Springfield and we were out there waving to everybody and uh, we would uh, do mostly uh, style shows and things for uh, around town, whatever was needed. Uh, we were in the Christmas parades and uh, help with Santa Claus and things like that. And then after I graduated from high school, I worked there for a while and uh, was gonna go on to school and ended up staying there and working through the buying program uh, that they had and became a buyer at the age of 20 and made my first trip to New York. So the the team board that you, was it did it have a was it called the team yes, board? Yes, the team board. And it Ren's just was kind of board. so Ren so and it just did stuff all so that was their kind of way to be involved, involved. with the schools yeah. promote um, uh, girls from the different schools. Uh, mainly it was fashion shows and we worked with Seventeen magazine at the time and. Uh, any, any events that they wanted to have, like I said, the opening of the first Taco Bell in Springfield, the Christmas uh, parades that we had, we would be part of the floats. And uh, it, was, it was a fun thing at the time. And then it got to, well, let's see, girls weren't interested in doing that mm -hmm. as time went on. So it kind of uh, dispersed probably in, I would say in the <coughs> maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did the like the fashion shows and things, was that something they always had at Wren's or did they do it at different places? Uh, mainly they were always at Wren's. We had a back to school fashion show. Uh, there would be bridal events where uh, we would have uh, special gowns shipped in from New York and uh, we had a bridal department at that time. So a lot of us girls, we got to wear bridal mm -hmm. gowns. Be and before we were ever even thought about getting married, you know, but it, it was like a traveling trunk show. So, and another one that we had was uh, Simplicity Patterns. We had a fabric department at the time. Uh, we sold fabric and uh, Simplicity would, again, made things, sent them in, and we would have shows uh, in our tea room. Or we also had a bump on the fourth floor, which was the auditorium. We had a stage and everything, so. Does anyone remember what where uh, what floor the tea room was on? That's the basement. It was the basement. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was downstairs. Yeah. Okay. Um, that Marguerite was talking about that. That was where the cafeteria was at the time. Yeah. Uh, right. When she was the tea there. room was there too. Oh, it had it had both at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you know anybody that else that does anybody know anybody that was part of that team board? Um, or that did, did, did you? Like uh, I'd like to ask Linda. Did she work with Rosemary Powell any? Um, she probably did. I mean, because Lin Linda was there all the way through uh, at Becoming Blocks, and she was out at the mall. So she was there from, like, 1969 to 2004. Yeah, I so don't remember probably... when Rosemary uh, retired, but she was in charge of all those fashion shows and everything, mm -hmm. especially on the fourth floor where, when they had the fashion shows. And they always had um, champagne brunch with it. Yeah, it was quite fancy. Hmm. Sounds like it. I'm, and, and this is got some questions. Okay, I'm Linda Anderson, oh. and this is a view from from our, around the '60s, um, showing uh, Renz there. Uh, this is one of my favorites, just because the, the cars and the in it, um, and it's a, a good view of uh, East Main Street. This one here, she's. talking about how the mall changed things a, a little bit um, and what, what how it worked having both stores open. Started in 69, which is just before, a couple of years before the mall. So you were part yes. of that mall transition. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about yes. um, that? I was a buyer at the time and uh, the mall opened up in uh, 1972. And we saw that really throughout the country. Malls started popping up when I first started downtowns were downtowns all the shopping all uh record stores discount stores Woolworths, everything was downtown then the evolution came to malls and uh that was a new thing so when the mall opened up nobody said well i'm not coming downtown and that started uh, many years of declining sales and um malls were exciting because you had lots of different stores you didn't just have two or three um, 
you would have to go out of town to go to Lazarus. You'd either go to Columbus, Reich, you'd go to Dayton and Springfield. We had Wrens at the time. And uh, a lot of little smaller, uh, well, we call them boutique stores now, specialty stores were downtown. Honings, which was a local owned store. Um, so then once the malls came, wow, people would say, look at all these different stores. I mean, there would be some restaurants, but for the young, for the middle-aged, uh, there, there was like shopping heaven in one, in one building. Everything was inside too. So once you parked, you went inside and um, you didn't have to go back out in the snow, the cold, the rain, you could just walk the mall. So then malls um, through many, many, many years were it, but it's funny with retail how, how it's changed again. Now people want outdoor entertainment again. So malls have been suffering right now and there's outdoor entertainment like the Green or Easton, what we have here in Springfield, you know, um, North Fountain. Mm -hmm. People are starting to go to all these new little places and they're popping up. So malls were the hit for a very long time. I made my first trip to New York. Uh, it was in 1970. No, the mall opened in 71, not 72. Mm -hmm. I made my first trip to New York in 71. I was the junior buyer and we bought for the mall and for downtown. But I can remember when we opened up our little store there, we were, all the merchandise was coming in, it was being unpacked, it was being hung, uh, visual would be in there doing displays. So it was quite exciting. It was, it was a whole different, again, everything on one floor. So did you split? Your, like when when the mall opened, did you split your time between both locations? Most of the time we were downtown, but we would go out uh, maybe two days a week. We had a separate staff of people out there. Uh, when we'd have events on the weekend, like again, we'd have fashion shows and uh, we would be out there on Saturdays. And we know for um, last, well, a year ago, just about a year ago, uh, couple weeks ago was was when the the mall closed um so it was really interesting to see that um you know she kind of got to see the whole change of working at the mall and seeing the decline of the mall then too um because she later moved to um and worked at macy's and retired from there uh, so kind of the ebb and flow of 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 retail and and how that's i always thought that was funny the the new things popping up like the green were emulating the downtown that a lot of downtowns had lost um, so we're bringing the, the downtown back down back now with new stores and businesses. Started in 60. So this is a the only picture I could find of Wrens out at the mall. Um, and I, I, if you guys can help me out about the location, I had always pictured it uh, where Macy's ended, um, where where Macy's last was. But I think she told me that it it had uh, it was on the other side of of the building. Um, so they were on, it was, so if you come in, it was to your, to your left and Macy's was on your right there. So, um, did anyone have any clarification on that? I think they might've had a multiple locations. Uh, I, I think Renz was on the west side of the building. Um, uh, it goes north and south. The, the main runway goes north and south in the mall. And Renz was on the west side uh, uh, toward the back, uh, and then it became blocks after that, and then Macy's, I think, after that. So then did Macy's move to the east side later, or did I it expand? Don't, I don't remember Macy's being on the east side. I remember being on the west side. All right. I may be wrong, but that's the way I remember it. No, I, I agree. And it was like where the batting cage place was, is kind of location wise on that west side. Oh, yep. Okay. After it closed. Yeah. But Renz was the first one. And then Blocks took over when Renz moved out. And then Macy's came in and when Blocks left. Isn't that Patty? How it yeah. went? Yeah, because they were owned by Macy's or Federated or Federal. I think she said, yeah. she said it was Allied and then Federated. Yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know the corporate names. I just remember the company. Yeah. This is another one she's talking about. 
in the store, but when we were rents, I was a buyer. And I mean, we would have, you know, maybe 10 buyers and we went to New York. We actually bought all the merchandise for both stores. Uh, and Jerry did all of that type of coordinating, anything under visual advertising. Back in the day, we did our own print. You didn't have anything digital. Mm -hmm. Digital. You, we had an artist that would draw. We'd take our merchandise up and say, okay, this is what we want to show in the Sunday ad. And she'd sit there and she'd draw it. And I say, well, last year we got a collection from Ann Armstrong. Oh, did you? Chapman. Yes. She, she had a lot of her... Um, her drawings that she had mm -hmm. done for ads alongside mm -hmm. the ads that ran. Yes. And she had um, she had some of the printing plates too mm -hmm. that were used for the paper. So that was I believe I have some of those too. Because like when we closed the building, there were things that like it's gonna go in a dumpster. Well yeah. I got I had I brought them all home and I've got them like stored in a tote and everything. Yeah. I know you I know that the first time I met Linda she had was doing a program out at the um, the Davidson Interpretive Center, um, one of those like uh, fireside history chats, and or she, I can't remember what the official talk was about. It was about downtown, but she came and she brought a lot of the stuff that she had saved from Wrens and Blocks and, and the downtown um, when the stores closed. Um, and she, at that time, she had donated some of the uh, window pictures that you'll see later. Um, that we had never had anything like that before in the archives. Um, so I was excited to get those. These are um, some of the drawings that we got from um, Ann Armstrong. She worked, um, she had a, a graphic design degree in um, design and photography from the University of Dayton, and she worked for Renz as their um, designer drawing ads for the um, for the paper from 1971 to 73. And I love these pictures because they look, they're so, so obvious the, the time period. I, I really love the designs here. Um, but these were some of the ones that she shared with us that we have um, in the archives now. And I, I, we had a few, we have a lot, we have several boxes of Wren's um, stuff uh, for, throughout the years, like employee handbooks and stuff. But these are some of the drawings from the 80s that we had, some 80s drawing cards that um, from, these are all from 1982. Um, some of the uh, different drawings that we had. We had pulled these out because we thought we, th these might still go on display. Um, coming up, but we, we um, were working on some stuff to put out um, in the lobby. Um, love this crocodile one. Very, I mean, style, actually, this has completely come back. <laughs> some of this stuff. Do you have any yeah. items from Jerry Boswell? He did Wait, most well, of that's, 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 that's coming, yeah, we've, we've okay. not, not anything specifically from him, but we do have, uh, I have some mention of him in the next uh, slide coming up. Yeah. Um, uh, Anne had a, a wedding dress one that was really wonderful, and I thought this was a, a good place to share. We had gotten a 1969 wedding dress, um, I think this year, uh, that we, um, this is some of the details of the lace on it, but it, it's still in its Wren's department store bag, uh, and it's a really, really great piece. Uh, these are some of the actual uh, printing plate uh, blocks that Anne had um, from some of the stuff that she had done. I thought these were really wonderful. Um, again, I'm pretty sure I saw people, girls at the fair wearing this exact same outfit you see in the middle one here. So all styles come back around. These are, this is a great one of the ones that she gave us that shows an interior picture, which I, we never really had interior photos before. So this is a really, really wonderful one here. Um, does anyone have any idea where we are <laughs> in the building from this? It's, I think these were around the 40s, 30s, 40s. I'm going to guess they might be from down in the basement area. Yeah, because they had they had oh, stuff down the basement say. as well yeah. as the tea it's room all and all down there, us. and yeah. you could yeah. shop it's down there as well. Faster. The exposed piping and everything kind of mm. bothers me. I, I think maybe it was down the basement, but I'm not sure. This is yeah, the bargain a basement. Bargain basement, yeah, yeah, bargain basement. That's they called it. Yeah, this is a great window one here. Uh, Marguerite talks a bit about some of the mannequins there and how easily they fell apart, but you could you could match up the hands and bits and pieces that you need to put them back together. Um, 
but these ones look like they just have kind of like plasticky kind of hair. She talks about about wigs in a little bit um, that they had to deal with. I think that's what this one is, or one yeah. of she talks. Um, they did primarily. men's department windows. He didn't, he very rarely worked over in the front windows in the front of the store and did all hand lettering of every sign that was in the window. Um, you know, did beautiful calligraphy work and, um, and Mr. Kite was an artist mm -hmm. too. Did they? Did he do the lettering for all of the windows, regardless of like? Did they? No, you just, did. he did the men's okay. window, and the women's, the women's side, <laughs> the men's side and the women's side, but the fashion windows. Uh, we had a a woman that came in, and that's all she did was make signs, but it was a, you know, a mechanical machine that she used to make signs, but she made them all in store and for our windows. So which windows were which in, on the building? Um, all of the windows on the Fountain Avenue side were menswear. And then there were no menswear in the, on the Main Street side at all. They were, I'm trying to think, not even shoes. Nothing, nothing on the Main Street side. Was... So you worked on the, the Main Street side yeah, ones? Yeah. How and many windows total were there? On the, on the Main Street, there were 12, 12 windows. That yeah, we that sounds right. Different sizes. Two, two main fashion, they call them fashion windows, that were mostly women's wear that were the biggest, two biggest windows in the, in the display. So, but you know, we had a corridor in between. As you came in the main entrance, there was a corridor. So there were windows surrounding that whole corridor. Okay, so if you, even if you were inside, there was windows you could see from the inside yes. too? Okay. Yeah, before you came in the store, but were like around the, what, what would you call it? Like an atrium, kind yes, of? Yeah, sort of. Uh -huh. yeah. So how often did you change the windows? It was according to the depart uh, departments and Mr. Kite and the advertising um, department, um, merchandising, oh, what they felt was most important. At well, the they time. Lived with so some, but we sort of had windows that were primarily this window always has merchandise from yard goods. We demonstrated or had in our windows yard goods that you unrolled and put on, you know, big frames to, and it was, it, that was tough, a tough window. <laughs> Some, the only department manager that did their own display was the shoe department and his name was Mr. Sheridan and he came in and did windows, small windows on the end of the large fashion windows that were just shoes uh, and he didn't change them every week. It was, you know, whenever so he it, decided to. It was really a, week, a weekly basis then? That pretty much the fashion windows always where you put uh, you know what you thought that uh, the public wanted to see um, they were changed every week but some would be in um, like the book you know we had a library in the store and we had a section that they displayed their merchandise and that would stay in sometimes longer than a week or a few but the big windows in the front had to be changed every friday because saturday was the time people came downtown everybody came downtown so you had to have fresh windows in on 
So we all hated Friday. <laughs> I, I thought, um, it, it, I don't know when they changed that layout of the atrium with windows around it, but um, talking to Linda, she did not remember having nearly that many windows. And it's, I mean, it's not like that at all now. They, the only windows that are still the same are the ones that are on Fountain Avenue. Um, she said that is the same layout that the men's side had. Pat. Uh, here's a great window layout. I love this one here. It's got, you can see, this here says, have your photograph taken at our studio on the third floor. So, you know, they had their own photography studio. Um, and I've seen people share their pictures online of family members and stuff that have the, the little Wrens logo down at the bottom, um, pictures that they had taken there. And this one, we've got some, some definitely they've got some wigs on in this one. I think she talks a little bit about uh, this one. She's talking about her most memorable window display that she worked yeah. on. Uh, are there any memorable windows that you recall doing? I, I'm muting you. I think the one that I remember most, uh, just what it looked like, one, because of its simplicity. And this was something that my boss had planned, you know, during, during the war because he knew that it was something. And so what we ended up, in both of those huge windows, I, I say huge, but they were the largest windows in store. Um, on both windows, you had a huge replica of the world painted in, in you know, appropriate colors. And it, and it was resting on clouds of fiberglass. You know, fiberglass, uh, it's, like insulation? Well, actually, it did look it was white and came in, um, uh, it came sort of like cotton, and it had to be sort of pulled apart and fluffed around so it looked like clouds. But the problem was, it truly was spun glass, and it shed little microscopic pieces of glass which felt like nettles i mean on your skin when you worked with it afterwards you know you you felt it all around your body <laughs> hated it <laughs> hated it so now they they use it to make bodies out of ships and cars <laughs> they don't use it for decorative purposes <laughs> But that a few years, they people bought it. You bought it in like a mat and sort of peeled it apart. And uh, they used it on Christmas trees for a few years. Yeah. yeah. My house. <laughs> so the dis rest of the display, so it was. But that, the and then it had big letters that said peace on earth. Yeah. And that's, that was the thing. It was just simple and, you know. I thought it was very effective, but I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> when did that? When did that one go up? On VJ Day. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was a you know crash course. <laughs> yeah, those are things happen quickly. And, but, uh, Do you remember that time? I I, I remember seeing in the paper talking about all the celebrations downtown on well both on VE Day and VJ Day. Um, stuff going on downtown. Yes. Do you recall? Just, just I remember. Just remember people, and of course, it still reminds me in pictures we still see in New York, and and that's that's we had our Springfield had our own New York. Natalie, I think that uh, what she's talking about they called angel floss in those days. Ah, okay. Does that sound familiar? Uh, I'm not, yeah, I, I I had not heard about, I mean, it sounded like like pink insulation to me, what she was describing. I think um, they called it angel floss. Yeah, this is um, somewhat, you know, what she was meant, this was the uh, celebrations for um, VJ Day um, in August of uh, 1945. So this was the, the celebrations around Springfield. Um, I love this one, the little, little baby, um, uh, Judy Geyer has the uh, is posing with the same uh, newspaper there in her in her little uh, walker 
Uh, and when you go downstairs, oh, sorry. I said, this is Linda try, trying to explain where the different departments were. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe some of you guys can remember where things were located. And when well. you go downstairs, you're thinking, okay, well, this used to be the Macy's cellar, mm -hmm. or this used to be part of the restaurant area. It is, and then I'll go upstairs and think, okay, um, third floor, that was the set. The second floor was like all fashion, mm -hmm. ladies, uh, all clothing, the bridal department. We had a fur department too. Mm -hmm. We stored people's furs. We had a fur vault yeah. back in the day. Yes, right. oh, nobody wants a fur, right? <laughs> and we got lots of them still hanging in closets and stuff. But yeah. people would bring in their furs and they would be cleaned and stored um, in the fur vault. Mm -hmm. Bridal department, see, people don't think of that. Yeah. A department store really had everything into one store, whether it was children's, whether it was fashion, whether it was boutique, whether it was men's shoes, cosmetics, all of it was in one area. Beauty salon. We had a beauty salon. We had a photography department. Um, there, I, I know um, from earlier earlier pictures in like the the twenties they had like a stationery department, and we know that they had a jewelry store. And um, <coughs> I don't know if anybody can remember. Um, I mean, it's hard to me for to imagine that all five of those floors. Um, over where the Bushnell building is, is was Natalie, for one store. Yeah, Bob. Uh, I think it was on the first floor. They had like a mezzanine and they had a post office up there where you could buy stamps and mail stuff. That's right. That's and, right. Uh, I think, didn't Kenny Miller do a lot of the windows? Kenny Miller? The... Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I'm pretty sure he did. And then he, of course, then he went on to live with Burt Reynolds. <laughs> well, this is another um, great interior photo that shows you this. So the, the toy land was up on the fifth floor yeah. here. Um, you can see it looks like they're looking at, looks like wrapping paper and stationary stuff over here and um, shoes and there's all Christmas, sorts of stuff. Their Christmas windows were always always beautiful. I don't think that's on the fifth floor itself. I no, think it's I think it's average. Yeah, the Toyland is on the fifth floor, but right. I think that might be down in the bargain basement again. Oh, okay. I would say that would make sense because there's a lot of different kinds of things that I'm seeing in this picture here. Yeah. Um, this is definitely the holidays. You can see the the Christmas wreaths all on on all of the right. um, pillars there. Also, uh, Renz had their own purse department uh, on the first floor. I remember buying an alligator purse there one time with some money my dad gave me for Christmas. And uh, that was didn't last very long. I spent a lot of money for something that didn't last very long. But um, anyway, they had their own purse department. They had, oh, this is, uh, this is the problem. Oh, Marguerite talking about some of the people she worked with. The problem, one of the biggest problems were the wigs because. Here we go, I'm gonna. Frank Mass. The boys all thought it was fun to try them on, you know? <laughs> and which you can't do because they were not like wigs that we wear now, they were stiff. And every mannequin had their own wig. You couldn't shift wigs around because their heads were positioned differently. So the wigs would fit differently. So we had to handle wigs with care. <laughs> uh, was there a person who designed the windows or did you guys have leeway to decide what um, you wanted to do? Mr. Kite, that was his prime responsibility was to um, get all the materials together to decide what the department needed and what kind of decor they were going to use. If we had special something, you know, um, Hawaiian or something special, then he was always the one that knew when those windows would go in and would order all the materials that he thought needed. But he, 
he never did a drawn plan. Uh, it was according to who was doing the windows. He thought they were capable of designing, and sometimes he would say, you know, what are you planning to do to use? And you'd say, well, we're going to do this or that. And uh, he'd make suggestions. But it was a very kind of, um, I wouldn't say catch as catch can, but it, <laughs> it relaxed. It was mm. a relaxed atmosphere like, about design. It wasn't put this here and here and here. Did you guys have like, department meetings where you would sit down and discuss future designs or anything like that or Never was it all in eight years no and you were there eight years <laughs> <clears throat> so when did you when did you uh leave friends i left friends um, after i got married and was pregnant for my first child so what year was that uh oh gee uh 1950, 51, okay. 1951, I guess, something like that, yeah. And after that, I came in um, on a part-time basis from time to time. When they were, when they, we worked really hard at Christmas time mm -hmm. because we did all the interior displays. And at that time, we put up everything on one night. So we had to wait till the store closed, and then then we started climbing ladders and putting stuff up. So everybody would come back to Christmas decor then. Um, uh, Natalie, uh, yeah, Bob mentioned um, Kenny Miller. Uh, I had mentioned uh, Jerry Boswell. Jerry, but, yeah, uh, Jerry and Kenny and George Miller all did. When all worked on down at Wren's and maybe Penny's some too. I can't okay. remember whether they did the other stores too or not, but Kenny and George Miller brothers uh, both worked uh, and, and so did Jerry Boswell because I remember mm. all those guys. Well, uh, I know another thing I've heard people talk about is going to see uh, Santa at Wren's. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Bill Zugelder's daughter. Um, with her Santa and me picture. And I know lots of people have these um, of their own where they got to, to go see Santa. Um, yeah. This was some, um, some giveaways that you, they, were, they were giving away uh, at Christmas time. Uh, so this was later, you can see that they were part of Allied stores. So this was, um, this was a much later giveaway there. Um, this is a pic an article that um, we ran across about um, Jerry Boswell last year, um, not long after he had passed away. Um, this was uh, a feature that they used to have in the newspaper regularly, what the teenagers are doing, and they would always have an article about somebody. And this was a great one from 1955 um, showing Jerry hoping to be an interior decorator. And it talks about at the time he was um, uh, working on store windows. Um, this was a, a mural that he had done in his bedroom at home. Uh, so this was, um, and that's who uh, Linda was mentioning earlier um, that she had worked with Jerry. Um, mm -hmm. And I think she might. Did you work with Jerry Boswell? Talk about oh, him. I did. Yeah. I worked, like I said, I worked with him till the very end yeah. when we closed the building. And then, and that would be, it was eight, 1984 when we closed Renz. Yeah, so we did a lot together and, uh, you know, he he was a great asset. Our windows were fabulous. He had a he had a flair for fashion, putting things together, and that's something you really can't teach too much. You know, you you have it, and uh, he he did all the displays, did the potluck players. I mean, that fourth floor of the building has a stage, and we put on events where people would come in and and see the potluck players at Christmas time, especially. We always said we had the best Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. We had the real Santa Claus downtown. I have my picture when I was a kid, mm -hmm. downtown Renz. And, and then I have my children's pictures, downtown Renz with the real Santa Claus. We've got some great pictures in our. I think. We, we knew Springfield. I mean, I was the junior buyer. I could go to market and pick out things that, you know, certain people in Springfield would like. Mm -hmm. And um, that was always the, the fun part of it. One of the biggest things that I think we did, um, 
we, t we converted the basement. You know, basements used to be considered bargain basements mm -hmm. in really all the stores. And Macy's in New York had made theirs as it's called the cellar. So our whole basement got redone and it was sort of taken off of the Macy's uh, basement. We had a new candy department. We had home goods. Uh, it was all set up kind of like boutiqued all the way around. So that was a big thing for Springfield. I mean, it wasn't just like a bargain basement. So they put a lot of time and effort and, and money into that. And that was a big success. And when we opened that, we had a launch. We had like a, a private party for all the dignitaries of Springfield. And that was, that was when um, oh, let me make, Calvin Klein jeans came out. Yeah. And that was like a big hit. Everybody was wearing Calvin Klein jeans. So that, that was, that was kind of interesting. So, so as a buyer, how does, what's the process there? Like, how do you decide like, or how, how does that, how does that whole process work of getting the stuff to the store? Well, we had a, uh, Allied stores had headquarters and you would go to headquarters and they would put on uh, fashion shows and, and tell you what the market's looking like and which vendors you should probably go see. So then you would make appointments and you would go to the vendors and you would sit down with them and uh, review their line, take notes. Then you made orders, sent the orders in and the merchandise came to us and we'd display them on, on the floor and how you wanted it set up from all the different vendors you buy. You have to have so many tops, so many bottoms, and maybe some of the groups were all collections. Being from Springfield, you kind of knew what would really go, but yet you wanted to be on the forefront of fashion too. So did you, did you buy from multiple departments yourself? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. You saw, I mean, I could, I could easily have 10 appointments a day with different vendors and you would pick and choose what, you know, you had a budget, of course, and uh, you would balance it out on what was the newest thing. Um, when Michael Jackson did Thriller, that was a big thing. And we had the glove and we had the little white shirt and the vest and we had a whole Michael Jackson um, department. Mm. So if that was what was trending, you know, we bought it, we brought it to Springfield. You can't be just kind of boring all the time, mm. you know. You, whatever, whatever New York was showing, we tried to bring back to Springfield. And whether it be in the dress department or the coat department, I have bought in ladies' first floor sportswear. I bought all of, uh, all the junior department. I bought coats. Uh, I was also a lingerie buyer. And um, we had a, what, what was it? Sort of like a Victoria's Secret area. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have Victoria's Secret at that time. So, you know, you mm -hmm. bought some of that too. Yeah, I was... Um So that was really interesting to me. I, I did not really uh, know the process of how stuff gets into stores. <laughs> That's not something that everybody thinks about. You just, yeah, you go to the store and the stuff you want to buy is there. Uh, but somebody's got to gotta figure that out. So um, I wanted to show you a few pictures of, of the, um, the wonderful display that um, uh, Ray had drawn up her own uh, design window drawing. So, you know, uh, Lawrence Kite might, might not have ever drawn up designs for his windows, but she did actually hand draw a design so we could figure out the layout for this. Um, so we got to bring out the creepy elves um, that live in the basement usually and that scare me whenever I go through the basement. I don't know if anybody actually remembers them in the, uh, in the windows there, uh, but, but we have those. Um, and uh, we have, this is actually the, the fireplace uh, from the mall. Um, from the, the mall Santa setup that we, we got to bring back last year when the mall closed um, and some other great stuff from, um, you know, different bags from and um, hat boxes. I know lots of people have hat boxes. Uh, and then this is the uh, history in your own backyard um, uh, poster that we have out there. And we've also got over at the library. Uh, and uh, Miranda Taylor, our um, one of our uh, interns from uh, Wright State uh, Public History uh, put together a display case on the other side showing some of the stuff we had, including a few um, Ren's credit cards, parking uh, passes, um, a fur, which we do have many furs <laughs> in the collection. Um, this is a, a Ren's fur and another hat box and some other stuff. So if you come down and check some of that out. Um, we'll, we'll be um, changing things out. I think we're going to be able to bring out the wedding dress um, coming up that we that we got as well. Um, and this is um, what will be the is is being called 
the Wren now, um, their original building, the McAdams, which is how I know the building. I'm not really sure where the McAdams, but but that's uh, historically that was one of the names. So I always think of it in my head as the McAdams building. But when they turn this into condos, it's going to be the Wren. Um, I believe that the Dillon Corps is the um, uh, company that is working on uh, restoring this. And that building was another one that almost came down. You know, I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, the windows were out and it, and it was ready to go. Um, and it managed to be saved. Um, uh, the Turner Foundation, um, one of their real estate arms is the one that um, owns this now, I think, and is, that, um, is working on this project. Um, so it'll be great to see um, what happens with that uh, in the next few years. Um, Natalie, something else that has never been brought up tonight, but um, I think it would be interesting to you. Um, Wren's uh, was, had a Girl Scout department and a Boy Scout department. And whenever we needed anything from Girl Scout department for me, we went down to Wren's. That was the go-to place for Girl Scout equipment. And same way with the Boy Scout equipment. My brother was in Boy Scouts. And uh, they, for years, they carried wonderful line of stuff. I did not know that. That's yes. good to know. So they had all the uniforms and they camping had, gear and... They had everything. I, I, a lot of my stuff came from Renz, yes. So. Oh, that's great. Well, I say, I think some people have passed on stuff to us. Girl Scout equipment that they probably got at Friends then if they bought it. Locally. They may have, you know, you yeah. could buy a can you could buy a canteen, for example, you know, and it's Girl Scout packaging, you know, that you hung on your shoulder, and, and all kinds of Girl Scout equipment. Yeah. <laughs> so same way with well, Boy Scouts. Um, so I know that they later became blocks in that location, and that I think that was still, I mean, change just a change of ownership. Um, did, does anyone recall like any major change in, in how the stores were at that time? Not really, Patty? I can remember that they, they I was managing the um, Shawnee Hotel as City Place Apartments at the time when Blocks really became involved there in the late 80s. And uh, people who were living at, or going to live at the Shawnee were just very thankful that there was another place taking over Wren's, you know, that they were happy with that, so. Well, and I, I say, I mentioned the the Wren, the, the, the soon to be condos, but the Bushnell building has had a, a new life. Um, uh, Jim Lagos has put a lot into that building, um, into to bringing that back and keeping it full of, of businesses, um, like the Fountain on Main restaurant is there, um, Stella Blue is in there, what else? Um, Code Blue uh, has offices, Clark Schaefer Hackett. There was there have been little stores that have come and gone in there. Gary Geist Dance Studio um, is up on, I don't remember, third floor maybe. I used to take my daughter there. Um, and now they have, you know, they have a, the banquet center is back. That, you know, they're they're doing they, it had been, you know, an event center and they have a, the the Bushnell event center that you can book there and have weddings and different things um, in that space. So, um, and I know that he, uh, Mr. Legos, put a lot of money in to make that um, uh, LEED certified. So it's a uh, green uh, building. So, um, Natalie? So yeah. yeah. In the uh, old McAdams building, there was a very, very popular spot in the basement. And it was called the Rec. And it was a pool room that was owned by Johnny Central, who was a city golf champion that, twice. And it, it was so smoky down there, you could hardly see the table. <laughs> so when, when, when was that a popular place? This was uh, 50s. 48, 48 to about 54. Yeah. Yeah. All the um, high did, school boys went there. <laughs> do what? I said all the high school boys went there. That's right. That's right. The 1950 basketball team, that's where they stayed. <laughs> uh -huh. Went to Jim's restaurant there beside the Regent, and then they went down there and played pool, I think, and stuff like that. Well, Jim's restaurant was right next door. Right, yeah. And then the Regent Theater. Yep. 
Does anybody have any any stuff from from Wrens um, that they that they've kept or that you've collected over the years? Natalie, I have the Santa Claus from the fifties, which I think you've seen. Oh, the window the window one? display. Yeah. yeah. yeah oh, I the one that, that and it moves too. Yes, yeah, that's yes, really it still neat. Moves. Yep. That's great. We have. I don't know if Roger is still on, uh, but he told me we have some mariachi window display little guys in our basement and apparently we got them working uh recently so they, um i, I don't basement? know how in the basement they should stay in the basement they should stay in yeah. the basement well that's what i said <laughs> about the elves but we brought the elves out <laughs> we haven't but, been able to find documentation that they're from wrens yeah. at this point but that's what i've always been told so but, yeah so I roger told me today that they work so <laughs> I was wanting to ask if anybody remembers the Weller Sewing Machine Company. It was either where that hole is now in, in the, the um, Rose Mural is located or in one of those other small, between the bank and Wren's. It was Weller Sewing Machine Company. And in 1953, I bought my first sewing machine there. And uh, um, I still have it. <laughs> huh? uh, yeah. And they had their own little little store. Yeah, there. The, yeah, yeah, it was called the Weller Weller Sewing Machine Company. Yeah. I was. Well, I, say, I have a memory. Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay, my name's Sarah, um, and I remember my mother taking me. I think it was in 1968. She signed me up for a course, and you mentioned Rosemary Powell, and I think right. she taught it. It was an etiquette class at Wren's and it really helped me to grow up and it's such a fond memory for me. You know, we we had a tea one time and and I think we generally met on the second floor near the bridal department, but in the end we we purchased a dress and we had a fashion show and I, I, I'm sure we learned, you know, how to put on our white gloves and and um manners and I just it, it's such a fond memory for me <laughs> that's really great it, yeah. and it wasn't the teen board it was totally you know you, you it was separate I've, I've heard people talk about that before too I can't remember what it had a specific name Natalie yeah hi I also when I was in high school um took the course from Rosemary Powell charm I think it was Charms, not oh, charms, school, charms charms school. something. Yeah. 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 Yes, and we learned how to walk like ladies with books on our head and how to sit in a chair properly with the books on our head. It was it was really a lot of fun. And we had a fashion show at the end. So I, I remember that. It was it was great fun. And also every, every August before school started, we went into rents and I got my pair of saddle shoes <laughs> every year during high school. People and we have, we have an aunt, Annabelle um, Siegfried, who worked for years in the cosmetic section of Renz when it was downtown. So yeah. and I also got my wedding dress at Renz. That's it. Thank you. I, I wanted to say people probably don't remember Rosemary Powell, but Rosemary Powell spent a lot of time going back and forth to New York, where she also served as a model. She was a, a New York model as well as working yeah. in Springfield. So, Natalie? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I, now that I know that Marguerite worked at Wren's, I understand why Dick Brinkman was the best dressed man. In <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, you know, the funny thing is she said that she was the first woman that they hired in the department. And the whole eight years that she worked there, they didn't hire another woman until when she was just about to be leaving. Um, and then when she, her and Dick moved up to the Kent area for him to go to grad school, after they got married, she tried to get a job at the department, one of the department stores in Akron, and they wouldn't hire her because they weren't hiring women in their windows department. Mm -hmm. So 
It was apparently not seen as a job for women to do. It wasn't. <laughs> well, um, what I said, we're always excited when we get new things that have to do with any of the, you know, downtown stores or anything in town. Uh, but I'm always excited when I when I see new Ren stuff <laughs> because oh, excuse me because we don't uh, we haven't had a lot. Um, I was really happy when um, Linda gave us some of those uh, window photos because um, I'd always heard so much about the windows and had never gotten to see any of them. So um, so yeah, well we're always um, happy to see what other people have to share and and and, uh, and all that. And I'm glad you guys came tonight. Um, our uh, next virtual program will be next week on uh, August 3rd, and it will be uh, with a special guest, our own registrar, Rachel White, and uh, one of our Wittenberg uh, Hagen Center interns, Gabrielle Doty. They're, it's gonna be about uh, archeology span experience, uh, their own personal experiences and relationships to um, relevance to museums um, and to today. Uh, so uh, Gabrielle just got back over the weekend from a two-week um, field study archaeology uh, field study with Wittenberg in Ireland. So she's going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, Rachel's background, um, before she came here, um, she has some background in archaeology and different jobs that she had. And, and since she's been here um, working on a re-inventory project, she's gotten to go through some of the stuff we have. So she's going to talk a little about her own experiences and about some of the interesting things that we have in our collection here. Um, so that'll be our program uh, next week at 7 o'clock on Zoom. So uh, thank you guys again for coming out and for sharing your stories. And um, always love to hear more. Uh, so I hope you guys have a good night. Hi, Natalie. Thank, thank, you. thank you for thank you to Linda for saving that stuff from the dump from yes. the, uh, yeah. Well, you know. I'm a, when when places close and people are saving the stuff. I'm I'm glad to know that that that, yeah. that kind of stuff gets saved. Uh, we lost a monument of stuff when uh, the Snavely brothers came in and tore up the Shawnee Hotel, and I didn't know about it until after the fact, but there was a, um, a, a place where they were doing a fill out by um, the IWF home at McWright, and ledgers and all kinds of things from the Shawnee Hotel with like vice president's signatures and things like that. People had been, famous people had been to the Shawnee. All that kind of stuff was put in a dump. Oh, and that's so sad. I yeah. I've heard I've heard similar Phil stories about this is true. Uh, what this is may true. be under other buildings around downtown yeah. too and different yeah. places of just a shame. Uh, so so happy happy when stuff can be saved. Yes. So. Yeah. Thank you for putting this on. Oh, thanks. Thank you guys for coming. Have a great night. Thank you, Natalie. See you next week. Bye.